Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible in a Year podcast. Whether you are listening on your own, with a friend, or a group of friends, we hope this podcast helps you connect with Scripture and also enriches your relationship with God. Here are your hosts, Luke Shortridge and Andy Rectumwald. Hi, everybody. Cedar Creek Radio is on the air. Luke Shortridge hanging out with Andy Rectumwald. Andy, how are you on this fine morning? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Fantastic, as usual. We are finishing up the book of Acts, Acts Part 2. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking about the travels of Paul today. Day, which really got me thinking about travels. Oh Andy, boy. have you done a lot of traveling in your a time? A lot? No, but some, yes. What's the farthest away you've ever been from this spot we're sitting in right now? Um, I've been to... This is tough. I don't know. I can't remember how long the flights were. Uh, I've been to Honduras. That's pretty far. Choloteca, and I've been to uh, Los Angeles. Nice. Those are my two furthest points, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I went to... L.A., San Francisco. I did a little bit of California touring, but yeah. uh, I think Monterey, Mexico is the farthest oh, nice. away that I've been. L.A. is pretty dirty. No offense to our L.A. listeners. Wow. It is. What? It's a that dirty a city. blanket statement. Oh, I've been there, so. I've been there, too. Didn't wear a blanket. It's kind of hot out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, today we're going to be talking about some travel destinations. So these are destinations that tourists often go to. I'm going to give you the name of a place, and it is your job to tell me what state this place oh, is in. Oh, gosh. Okay. okay? So yep. you'll see how well you know your, your tourist traps. Not well. All right. First up, Pike's Place Market. They make coffee, I'm pretty sure. No, they don't. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would guess Seattle. Yes, but that's not a state, so no. Uh, sorry, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Washington. All right, we'll, we'll give you credit there. Yeah, yes. I wasn't really paying attention. Uh, Pike's Place Market in Washington is the home of the flying fish. So this is where they throw the fish and they, like, bid on it. So it's a farmer's market for fish called Pike's Place. I'm assuming wow. that's where Starbucks got the name for their Pike's Place Very coffee nice. that everybody buys. So, all right, built in 1907. There's only 10 million visitors a year. How many is that between not friends? A, not a lot. Okay. We get that many. All here. right, next up, this is tricky, Union Station. Uh, uh, California. What? I don't know these things. Really? I told you it's going to be a rough time. I'm not good oh, with this country. That is disappointing. Union Station? All right. California. No, not even close. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a hint. Okay. It's technically not a state. It's in a district. The District of Columbia. There you go. We'll take it. Washington, (laughs) D.C. I've actually been here. It is a massive train station, uh, which was supposed to, when it was built in 1907, symbolize the many arches and uh, many ways to America's capital. Oh, wow. Okay. Only 36.5 million visitors a year. Hmm. Okay. Next up, Balboa Park. Say it again. Balboa Park. Is that in Illinois? No, why'd you guess Illinois? I have no idea why I guess Just Illinois. Do you even know how to use context clues? Nope. Bal- oh, Rocky Balboa. <laughs> Still, I'm keeping my answer, Chicago. <laughs> it's not doing nothing. It's in Chicago, Illinois. Okay, you're way <laughs> off. This one is in California, which oh, you just man. kept saying. It's actually in San Diego. Okay, that's uh, a great place. It is a 1,200-acre mini city, basically, with 15 accredited museums, wow. nine performing arts groups, 16 gardens, a miniature railroad, golf course, tennis courts, and oh yeah, the San Diego Zoo is there as well. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, next up, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Fanuli Hall Marketplace. Fanuli Hall Marketplace. Fanuli, I'm, I'm already... Can you I've spell it for me? This. Yeah, I will. If anybody knows this place, they're laughing at me right now. F A N E U I L. Faneuil. Fan. I'm. I'm gonna any, guess. Anybody uh, who knows this. North Dakota. Is, what? <laughs> what is in North Dakota? <laughs> Nothing. But I've never heard of that place. So, North Dakota. Final answer. All right. There's also connected to it, uh, Quincy Market. That's another hint for you. Quincy. I have a duck named Quincy. Named after a, a president. Oh, I'm going to guess Pennsylvania. No. Okay. Good guess, though, right? You're way off. <laughs> no. Uh, this is Massachusetts. It's in Boston. That's so, Fanuel. Do you know how it's pronounced, Eric? I'm an idiot. 
Yeah, well. I should have researched this better. Fanua <laughs> Hall in Quincy Market. Uh, it's a massive market, uh, 15 million visitors a year. And anybody who's been there is going to be sending us hate mail shortly. Wow. Uh, the nickname is the Cradle of Liberty. Has over Liberty 100 Bell shops in and specialty push carts. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right. So this one here, this is two states we're looking for. I should this be able to get two. this. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I'm going to upset a lot of people here. Uh, Nine million visitors a year. The Great Smoky Mountains. Mm-hmm. This is going to upset anybody who knows anything about geography because it's not my forte. <laughs> I think we know that already. <laughs> um, so I would guess I want to go out on a limb here and say Tennessee. Yes, that's oh, one. Yes, because I drove through there and they had, um, let me just say. Um, it's another state that touches it. West Virginia. No, that's a good guess. Okay, North Carolina. Yes! Bam. I was born there in North Carolina, so I should have known that. All right, there you go. It's an 800-square-mile park. It's bigger than my apartment. Slightly. (laughs) Includes a slice of the Appalachian Trail. All right, next up, (laughs) the Navy Pier. Uh, That would be in Illinois. Yes, even got the Chicago, Illinois. Chicago. All right. Tell us about the Navy Pier. Have you been there? Yeah, it's got a Ferris wheel, um, a cool True. museum, yep. um, an ice cream shop, like a Ben and yes. Jerry's, I think. Yeah, I've been there multiple times. Great yeah, place. I've been there, too. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. All right. Next up, the Four Corners. Four states. Eric knows I got to name all four states. It's ridiculous. Yeah, Obviously, four. they're like the shape of a square, right? Um, uh-huh. I'm going to say... Well, Eric's giving me a look. New Mexico, is that one of them? Yes. Okay. Now, I don't know the rest of the geography of that area. So, New Mexico, yes. Arizona. Yes. Give me a second. New Mexico and Arizona are my first two out of four guesses. And this place was in Breaking Bad. Yeah, it was a scene when... Uh, well, oh, the Four Corners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant the other state. Yeah, she like, flipped a coin to yeah, see where she's Yeah, she did. Be. I don't know the other two. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Help us out, Eric. It's uh, Colorado. Yes. And Utah. Yeah, oh, I nailed it. Utah. And, and literally, Ooh, what have you been, been there? there? There's I like a not. plaque on the ground with a staircase overlooking the this little okay. plaque that okay. has uh, four corners with each state seal in it. Like, you think it's kind of cool, but then surrounding it is absolutely nothing, nothing. but <laughs> desolate <laughs> desert and a couple of porta potties. Wow. Like, I'm serious. And people go up there, they crawl up there, they lay down in all four corners. Yeah, or they put I, I their was little looking feet at all four pictures corners. of people like yeah, playing exactly. Twister, where I'm they're like, four I'm states all four states. Hmm. Like, uh, okay. Okay, wow. moving on. Very nice. nice. Uh, so when I was researching this, I was looking at the... Uh, like worst tourist destination, <laughs> and they said Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts. Oh, uh, why? Well, the description of it is it's a rock. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul today, who was a man who had many travels. Yeah. Um, the Book of Acts. If you haven't checked out Part One, um, I would say check that out first, just so you get a little bit of context of yep. what's going on at this point. This is the early church. Um, We're going to read about Saul, who's converted into Paul. Uh, We're going to be reading in the New Living Translation, if you want to follow along with us. Now's a good time to pull out a Bible, or if you're listening on your phone, switch to a Bible app. Uh, Also, we're going to ask some questions as we go along here, so feel free to stop the podcast and discuss if you're listening with a group of friends. If you're listening by yourself, feel free to journal if you want as we get to the questions, and we'll do our best to answer them as well. So we're going to begin today Acts chapter 9, which really begins uh, Saul's uh, story, his calling. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats in every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul answered, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained blind for three days and did not eat or drink. 
Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now, and I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I have heard many people talk about the terrible things that this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Hmm. All right, so this is kind of crazy. Saul goes from enemy of the gospel to one of its greatest champions Mm -hmm. in a very dramatic way. Um, You know, it's funny. I think about Ananias. He's probably the most unlikely hero in the Bible. Yeah. In that you hear nothing about him. Right. I mean, when's the last time you went to a Bible study on Ananias or did a character (laughs) study? You don't. But if he doesn't listen to God, to God here. I mean, if he doesn't, if he's not obedient to Jesus, who says, go and find Saul, who knows what happens to Saul? Yeah. And without Saul, maybe we're not sitting here today. I don't know. Um, but Ananias was obedient. And because of that, uh, Saul's life dramatically begins to change, Mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. So Andy, here's my question. Have you ever seen God use an unlikely person? And if so, what happened? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, taking me out of it, I never thought that I would be <laughs> doing this. You're the but, most unlikely of all? Yeah. No, uh, I look at a lot of the friend, my close friends that I have, like my buddy Nick, who's one of my best friends. Yeah. Um, was He shared his story on the on the main, on a main stage video, so I'm, I feel liberty to, to, Please to tell divulge us. some details. Um, but he used to be into all kinds of just bad stuff, drug dealing. Yep. Um, violent things, running from the cops, uh, weapons, stuff like all kinds of just n- just crazy things. Um, and then he picked up a Bible in his basement one day and started reading it, and his life just totally... It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so him, I mean, like Chad Schramm at our White House campus, similar story, also on the main... Daniel, my brother. Um, <laughs> I... I don't know. Maybe I surround myself with people with crazy <laughs> stories so I can All share them. All of your them. friends had really rough past. What's right. going on there? I just, I don't know. I'm attracted to that kind of thing, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And I think all three of those guys would would say the same. They would say, like, yeah, I don't think, like, other than the, other than God, that it doesn't make sense that I get to do what I get to do. So. Yeah. What about you? Well, God used a pretty unlikely source in my life. When I was in high school, you know, I had accepted Christ at this point, but I had done nothing with my faith. I mean, yeah. I, I, Cedar Creek b- began and started when I was 13 years old. My parents were part of the original core, and I yeah. came, and I was not happy about it. I was just not with the program. I did not want to be there. I had no friends that came to the church because the church was really small. And we had went through several different youth leaders that didn't work out so great, uh, and this guy, Steve, showed up, and I'm like, great, here we go, another guy who's going to be here for six months, and then he's going to move on. And I, I found out later they hired Steve because he worked for free, and <laughs> he went to Bowling Green. He was an RA and worked for the university, so he was self-supporting at that point. Yeah. And he somehow um, we got in touch with him through he went to the H2O Bowling Green Church there, and he came and said, yeah, I'll, I'll help with the youth. There was only at that time like five or six high schoolers that came. So he said, I'll help out with the high school group and work for free. Um, this guy was an unlikely source because he was one of the most closed off and angry individuals I've ever been around. Um, <laughs> he, he would admit that as well at this point in his life. Um, and the only emotion he really knew how to show was anger. Like I saw pictures of the guy's wedding later, and he's gritting his teeth. Um, at one point, <laughs> we went on a youth trip. Brent Proley and I went, and uh, there was this, like, lightning storm happening, and we were like, yeah, lightning, that's awesome. 
And he's like gritting his teeth. He's digging his fingernails into the steering wheel because he wanted to kill us because we were so <laughs> obnoxious, which is true. Um, but but for all of the things that Steve had going on, Steve cared about me, and he would not accept my pat Christian answers that I give him because I had figured out how to like talk oh, to yeah. talk. Yep. And he saw right through it. And Speaking he's like, "No, you don't believe that. You know yeah. what? What do you really believe?" And Steve cared about me, and he if I didn't show up to something, he'd be calling me, hey, where are you? I'm counting on you. Yeah. And um, he asked me to go on a uh, trip to Columbus to hear this guy speak, a pastor who would help change his life. And I went, and I was just floored. God spoke to me in an amazing, dramatic way. Uh, I came back and started making some real changes in my life. And for the first time, I started to really read the Bible on my own and pursue God on my own. And Steve played a huge role in that. And I've kept in contact with him today. It's It's been fun. He still calls Brett and I like his kids, like his youth group. Hmm. Um, it, to my knowledge, I don't think he ever led any other youth program or youth group ever after that. That was it. Um, but he had a huge, huge impact in my life. And I'm still thankful to him to wow. this day. Super yeah, cool. Pretty wild. All right. Well, we're going to move on then to Acts chapter 13. We're going to read 1 through 12, the story of Barnabas and Saul going out on a mission. Uh, Andy, you want to take this for us? Acts yeah. chapter 13. We'll start in verse 1. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Menaean, these the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport at Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There, in the town of Salamis, looks like Salamis. <laughs> <laughs> they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. All right, this is awesome. So there's a lot going on yeah. right here. Uh, first off, I would say this is Paul's dramatic renaming, not very dramatic. Yeah. It's just, oh, by the way, they called him Paul. Um, <laughs> Saul was his Jewish name. If you remember, Saul was the first king of Israel. Mm -hmm. And as Saul is commissioned to go out to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people, he's renamed Paul. And it, it really, I think, is fitting with the conversion that he had went through. His heart had changed, and God changed his name as well. Sure. So he is commissioned along with Barnabas to go out to take this message of Jesus past the walls of Jerusalem and start to tell people about it. And instantly, fittingly enough, they run into opposition. There's people who are opposing them. Uh, oftentimes, when Paul would go into a city, he would first go to the synagogue. He was Jewish. He would begin teaching the Jewish people there about Jesus and talking about the prophecies of Jesus and how he fulfilled them. People would come to faith in him, but after a while, the Jewish leaders would realize that, oh my gosh, this guy Paul is stealing our people, yeah. so they thought, uh, and they would send them out of the synagogue, they would beat them, they would stone them, and then Paul would talk to any Gentiles that were there, any other people from the city, mm -hmm. and he would tell them about Jesus. Eventually, the leaders would persecute him again, and they would drive him out, and he'd go to the next city and repeat. This happens over and over and over. So the very first city that Paul and Barnabas go to, they meet opposition, and God allows a miracle to happen. Um, this false prophet becomes blind, and through this miracle, and also through the teaching of Paul, which I'm sure was powerful, and the teaching of Barnabas, uh, this governor becomes a believer, which is, you know, it shouldn't happen. This, right, this guy, right. I don't believe, was Jewish. All of a sudden, he sees what's happening. Um, he's got a very Roman name. 
And he becomes a believer in Jesus, which is phenomenal. And the message of Jesus Christ begins to spread in very different places in Jerusalem, which is super cool. All right. So, uh, Andy, my question then here is, have you ever had someone oppose you when you were speaking or acting for God? And how did you respond when that happened? Um, Yeah, so the first thing I thought of is there was a girl that used to go to Vertical, um, and she, at the time, was a non-believer. Her boyfriend was a um, self-proclaimed atheist, God-hater, like that kind of stuff. sure. Um, And they were like freshmen or something, and so she had asked if I could answer some questions for her. I said, sure, and I answered some questions, and she said she really enjoyed the conversation, and then she said, what resources do you could I use to read about this stuff? And I, sure, brought, yeah. I bought her the case for Christ. Nice. So the next week at Vertical, I walked up, and they're sitting there. I said, hey, I introduced myself to her boyfriend because I'd never met him before. Okay. And I said, I got that book that you wanted, and he looked at it. He took it out of my hands, first of all, which okay. I was like, okay, kind of invading my personal space there, and I don't really enjoy <laughs> that, but whatever. And uh, he, he goes, well, I don't want her reading this. I'm like, that's fine. You're not her husband, and so I don't really care. <laughs> and so my response, that was the first of my many bad responses, and he goes, well, I don't believe in this stuff, and she's not going to be convinced of it and I said I'm, I'm honestly I'm doing what she asked me to do which is give her a resource and he and he kept being very um combative in a sure. sense yep and eventually I just told him like listen dude if she doesn't want the book that's fine but you don't own her so just stop or you can leave and he's like okay all right fine well you know like I just she's never gonna I'm like that's fine and you can read it too when she's done if you want to read it <laughs> so that was the first thing I thought of was that okay. because it was it's still singed right in my mind so what happened um, she became a Christian on a mission trip. He stopped coming to church after he had vandalized the upstairs where Fusion is now. No, he awesome. vandalized many things up there and then also drew very profane things in the bathroom on one wow. of our stalls. So he did eventually leave the church, quote, um, after they okay. broke up because she became a Christian. Huh. Yeah. And I wonder where he's sure it wasn't because he wasn't getting fed. It- <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I'm not feeling led to tell you my answer. No, just kidding. Um, I, you know, I was thinking about, and, and I'm not going to say names here. I'm really not going to say names. Yeah, we, we hope um, so. Have, have you ever heard? Have you ever had a volunteer joke with you like, "Well, I'm a volunteer, so you can't fire me." Yeah. Yeah. Well, nobody says that to me, and this is why. So, <laughs> I uh, I get to the campus, to the White House campus, which I'm currently at. I'm the associate at the time, and this one guy, he just rubbed me the wrong way from the beginning. And I just started to feel like he had ulterior motives, and maybe he wasn't there for the most pure reasons. Uh, he was a greeter, but he was a hugger, and he would hug everybody, yeah. especially the women. And he would often corner women as they were, like, coming out of the bathroom and try to have private conversations with them. Ah. And it, it just it made my skin crawl when sure. I watched him do this. And eventually I thought, you know, I'm going to talk to him about it. Um, so I, I said, hey, can I talk to you? And I said, this, this really makes me uncomfortable when you do this. And I, I was very nice. I tried to talk through it. Well, he just was not having it at all. He was like, you know what? I'm here on my time with my friends, and you can't tell me who to be friends with. And if I'm going to be friends with people, and he's getting loud, and it's getting heated. So I started to get loud back. And I said, <laughs> there you go. I said, no, I uh, you cannot do whatever you want on your time. I said, if you are here serving in a serving capacity, then you have to listen to the authority that's been placed above you, which in this case is me. And you know, th- this guy's like 20 years older than me, so he's just not respecting me right. at all. So he starts shouting back. And it, I mean, we are like face to face going at it. It's getting loud. So uh, we had some of the officers that were there, and I kind of motioned for them to come over. So I, I had them, like, standing almost, like, behind me to the side. He's like, this is a setup, isn't it? You planned this the whole time. And I said, sir, <laughs> I did not plan this the whole time, but you need to calm down or they're going to ask you to leave. So he just went off. He called me crazy. I mean, cussed yep. me out in the middle of the yep. lobby, went off. And I, I said, you know what? This isn't the church for you. Um, this is just not working out at all. I wish you well, but please don't come back. And I had the police escort him out, and I never saw him again. Wow. Yeah. That's intense. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and thinking about it, you know, a- as a church, I I desire to be compassionate and loving and patient. And if somebody comes in and they are hurting, e- even somebody who's toxic, um, I will do whatever I can to help them and show them the love of Christ. Yeah. But if someone comes in and they are a wolf and they are here to devour sheep and they are here for their own motives, they're just not going to be welcome. I mean, that, I think that's part of my calling as a pastor is to protect the flock, to protect the people. 
how that God has placed in the church. So sometimes you got to be as wise as serpent and as gentle as doves. And um, ministry is not for the fate of no. heart, I guess. Nope. All right. Well, we're going to move on then to Acts 17, 16 through 23. Paul preaches in Athens. This is one of my favorite stories in Acts. Andy, I know you, you like this one too. Yeah. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols that he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, What's this blabberer trying to say with all these strange ideas that he's picked up? Others said he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things. We want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all of their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God. This God, this God whom you worship without knowing is the one that I'm telling you about. And he goes on at that point, and mm-hmm. he explains the message of Jesus Christ, which I think is very cool. What, what I love about this, Andy, is Paul contextualizes his message for his audience. Yeah. He doesn't change his message. He's not talking about a different God. Sure. But his approach is rather different than it had been before, especially yeah. when he's talking to the Jews in a synagogue. Right. This um, is totally different. Totally different. So uh, my thought here then is um, thinking about culture and modern-day culture, how to share the gospel with somebody who maybe uh, lives in a, and we can debate about this if you want, but lives in a post-Christian society where they've heard about Jesus and they think they know him, but really they probably don't. Uh, my question here is, is modern-day culture in America good or bad? Is it good or evil? And then how can we translate the message of Jesus in a way that the people of modern-day America can relate to and hopefully will embrace? Yeah, this is a, it's a good question um, because the word culture is used in so many different ways. Sure. Um, and you, you want to be careful not to... Uh, separate yourself completely from culture, as you see a lot of Christians that demonize the entirety of culture. Um, but I well, think... And, and for the record, the church I grew up in, we absolutely separated from culture. Sure. You know, the culture of the world was evil and wrong and bad. You stay away from it. You separate yourself from them so that no impurity would be among you. Right. And I think that when you look at the way that Jesus interacted with the culture and he Paul interacted with the do culture... That. <laughs> right. So there's Neither a... Is Paul. <laughs> right. And I think that the, the mentality we should have as believers is not that the culture is off limits but it's something that we can help hope to redeem that Christians should be a part Amen. of creating culture, not just reacting to it. Yep. Um, and so even here, Paul's dealing with two different kinds of philosophers, yeah. the well, Stoics. Well, hold on. I, Cause I want to go on the other end of the spectrum yeah. too. I think there are those who embrace culture and say, you know what, this is where people are going. We got to meet them right where they're at. Right. And completely sell out the message of Jesus. Yep. And you know, when Jesus talked to people, he kind of, didn't skip past their sin problem. Nope. Like he addressed them right where they were. He wasn't afraid to call people out. It wasn't like, oh, whatever you're doing is fine. Woman at the well, keep picking up new husbands. Who cares? Right. Like he said, no, your sins are forgiven, but go and sin no more. Right. He addressed them right on. There are Yeah, there are two extremes. And I think you see it. Sometimes you'll see today the pastors that get in the news for the things that there are the different types of church. What was the um, organization, the denomination that just got in big trouble um, because they, they're allowing gay marriage or something like that it's uh the it's a major denomination and they got <laughs> buddy that's like most denominations no today. <laughs> i mean like this is a <laughs> there's a, yeah there are a few but it just recently in the news where you see that you you, you have to pick something here you either go with culture or you're okay. against it all right i think there is a um a good i don't know in between i guess in a sense so you see paul engaging with the stoics and the um epicureans and the the epicureans were like no they were very materialistic yep there's no morals there's no it's just materialism that's yep. it the whereas stoics the stoics were, were not devoid of emotion yeah but they were you know yeah, yes logic and, but they yes you're, you're governed by natural order rich. there are laws <laughs> there are morals but it's you have to just just do them yep 
And so he he found the in between of these people, and he's telling That's them right. like, "Hey, I see these yep. statues of gods, whatever." Well, and he compliments them as being very religious, right? Which is interesting because they were very pagan, you right. know. So um, I think with us today, the second part of the question was, "How can we translate the message of Jesus to the people of modern day America?" I think one thing that um, excites me, but it's also kind of scary sometimes, is that we do have a tendency to, um, or a, a good tendency to go into the culture. Yep. You have apps that churches use now sure. um, where we could just simply say, well, we're not going to do that because the technology is of the devil and all that kind of stuff. However, there are certain circumstances when you let your theology be influenced by culture, then you run into extreme problems. Yep. Yeah, man, it's a fine line. You know, I, I don't think culture is good or bad. I think it's a tool like money that yep. can be used for good or bad. Um, I, I believe as Christ followers, it's our job to understand the people we're trying to reach and what drives them and motivates them. You know, culture is just what is commonly accepted and mm-hmm. practiced and agreed upon. So it's important for us to know that. Um, and, and I think, you know, where Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, becoming all things to all people so that I might save them, it's important for us to be able to speak the language of the people uh, in America today and to know um, you know, what, what is accepted? What are they thinking? How are they acting? Um, if you don't know and you can't relate with the people that you're trying to reach, then you're just weird and mm-hmm. eventually you're irrelevant. Right. Yeah. We were at a, um, a conference and there was a, a guy who's big into, uh, he's a, he's a, like a family ministries director guy for a, sure. a major church. And, and, um, you know, I've heard this before, but there's the three ways you could look at culture. At, at culture, you could either reject it, yep. you could receive it, which is yeah, whatever, yep. or you could redeem it. And yep. I know for for years, not years, I guess, but as soon as Snapchat that app came out, you know, yeah. where you take a photo, send it to somebody, and it disappears after ten seconds. Like my initial reaction is, what on earth are you using that right, for? Yeah. That's positive, you know. And so yeah. I was ab- adamantly against it, against it, and then. This question gets brought up, and this guy who's who's answering, he's part of this church. He says, "You know what? Um, I think instead of all of us, uh, instead of all of us getting up in arms over this app, wh- why don't we have more Christians on Snapchat so we can <laughs> redeem it for the power of the gospel?" And I just like it was one of those times where I just went, I felt I felt oh, the physical <laughs> conviction of the Holy Spirit going, yeah. "Eric, you're a moron. You know what? Why don't you redeem this instead of trying to reject it or?" You know, because my my default is to reject. Right. I don't like this. Let's not yeah, do it. It's too. of the devil. Right on. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, we're going to skip ahead. And we're, man, we're missing out on so many good things. But we're going to go to Acts 28, 23 through 31. This is the end of Acts. Um, and uh, it begins, So at a time was set on the day that a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures, using the law that Moses and the books of the prophets, he had spoken to them from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things that he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they were left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, go and say to the people, when I hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. Hmm. And that is the end of the book of Acts. Yeah. It ends very abruptly. Yep. So church tradition says that Paul stayed there. He probably wrote most of the New Testament, his letters, while he was there, mm-hmm. uh, awaiting trial in Rome. Uh, church tradition, though, says that he did go on trial at Rome and was executed for his faith. Sure. Um, I, I heard some theories about why the book ends there uh, at that place and doesn't continue on. It's possible that uh, Luke just had to stop at that point. Like, he just had to send to Theopolis what he had, and that was as right. far as he got. Um, another theory is that perhaps he was planning on writing a third book um, and continuing on, and that's been lost. I don't know. Um, I, I think also um, Luke had done what he had set out to do. He shows Paul uh, writing the books of the New Testament that he knew other people would read yep. and accept, and he he had shown how 
the message of Jesus Christ had moved in so many dramatic ways. I mean, the book of Acts really is not a biography on Paul. It's about the message of Christ, and it's about the church, which had continued to spread and was going to continue to spread despite incredible persecution and opposition. Yeah, I think that um, you see Paul being called out of, like he was an expert on the Jewish law and called to go preach to the Gentiles. You're right. Who didn't yeah. know the Jewish law. Yeah. Um, and didn't apply, you know, so the, our question, my question then is, how do you judge your life to be like a success or a failure? Sure. And what's one thing that you wish to accomplish in your lifetime? Yeah, I would say, I guess one thing I hope to see through the course of my lifetime, I'd love to see all my kids come to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to see them marry strong Christians if they decide to be married. Um, but that's not really something I can control or I can right. do. I mean, I can be a good witness, but I can't force them on mm -hmm. either of that. Um, so, you know, I was kind of thinking about my life. I, I'd like to teach in a seminary someday. Um, I, I probably need to go back and get my doctorate to do that. Yeah. Um, but to help to train young pastors, uh, people that uh, feel called to ministry, not that I have to wait till I'm in seminary to do that, but I don't really ever see myself retiring in the traditional sense. Sure. I just see my job changing. Yeah. Um, I hope to continue to minister in some way, some place uh, for the rest of my life. And I don't know where God will lead me in that, but I think that would be cool to be able to get my doctorate and teach someday. How about you, Andy? Yeah, um, I, obviously we we plan on having more kids, and I would love to see all my kids. Same thing, fall in love with Jesus. and Not me. We had a very public surgery a couple of years back, which <laughs> everybody found out about. Jeez. Um, and I, I kind of, I'm on the same page as you. I think I, I want to teach in a, in a university or seminary at some point. Um, one thing that draws me away from seminary and to university is my experience in a ah, secular university. Yeah. So I'd love to teach in a secular university, but I, I in the same uh, boat you're in, I need to probably go get my doctorate degree once I'm done right. with the master's. Yep. So, um, but I think the interesting <laughs> thing is here. out there wants to sponsor some young theologians with yeah. doctor degrees, let us know. <laughs> um, the question, though, how do you judge your life to be a success or a failure? I think, yeah, what do you think? For me, because culture, I guess, and and um, in the United, in the Western world is so driven on um, monetary success and notoriety, like being known. Yep. Um, I, I've, I really want just to be faithful with what I have, what I've been given. I don't need to be. Um, we have this whole thing about church planning here, and how we want, and that's great. I don't think I need to ever be the top guy, be, need to be known that way. Um, plus, I, th I just don't know if I can handle the pressure. But I just really want to take what God has given me. That's why I think I want to go to university and teach in a university or in a seminary because I think God gave me a mind for that. I just want to be faithful with what he has given me, with my family my um, yep. and my knowledge. So. Yeah, I, I think you're right on. I think that God calls each of us to be faithful um, I don't think we're responsible to see those come to faith in Christ that God hasn't put in our path. Um, and it's our responsibility, too, to continue to listen to Him and yeah. to follow His guidings and promptings. Um, as Eric had mentioned earlier, it's our, it's our job to be listening, but also process through Scripture, go to wise Christian counsel, um, try to find out what has God called me to do and what am I, um, what am I responsible for? That's yeah. an important question. Good stuff. Well, gosh, so many good stories in the book of Acts. Um, feel free to go back and read it. I think you'll be blessed because of it. Um, if you'd like to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Luke Shortridge or Andy Rectumald. We would love to accept your friend request. You can email us, podcast at cedarcreek.tv. And if you're liking the podcast, please feel free to share it on social media so other people can check it out. We appreciate yeah. when you do that. Uh, next time up, Andy, we are going to be discussing Romans. Oh, yeah. We're very excited. It's going to be good. It's going to be awesome. All right. Thanks. Until next time. See you later. See ya. Bye, guys. See ya.